The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in Romans chapter 2, and we are at verse 25. <clears throat> Romans 2, 25. All right, we are commanded to lay aside uh, the sin that so easily besets us. Our propensity to commit sins of cognizance, you knew it was a sin. Sins of ignorance, you didn't know it was a sin. It's still a sin. You are able to, uh, at any time, in any place, this is the wonder of God's plan. And spirituality is by grace. And all that is required of the believer is the uh, willingness to name, cite, or acknowledge personal sin, wherever you are, whatever it is, and you are, based on 1 John 1, 9, cleansed and forgiven and restored to fellowship until you commit, commit your next, let's say, mental attitude sins, because all sins are sponsored by the mental attitude. So let's prepare ourselves for our study. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're under the royal imperative to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and the related imperative to grow in grace and knowledge. And that is exactly why we are here and we thank you for everything you provide us with in these times so that we can have the freedom and the resources to be under face-to-face -face teaching. Bless this session to that end in Jesus' name, amen. All right. We'll quickly reread the verses from last night as I powered through them <laughs> and make mention. Again, Paul's objective in chapter 2 is to demonstrate that the Jews are anything but off the hook. They are indicted too. They do the same things the Gentiles do, and they rely on the law, but their reliance is not based on the true interpretation of the Mosaic law, only the external commandments and not what the law is designed to direct the reader of it towards, and that is a solution to the sin problem. The law makes one aware of different categories of sinning, and the individual who hears this would, if at all honest, recognize that these are the things they do. They may not do some of the big overt sins, uh, stealing, there's lying in there. Uh, a lot of people do that. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, adultery, murder. But the 10th commandment addresses the issue of mental attitude sin, that mental attitude you are not to covet or lust after your neighbor's wife, his uh, possessions, anything like that. That's the 10th commandment. So it brings uh, before the reader that mental attitude sins are sins too and constitute breaking the law or the covenant. When Moses came down from the mountain and the Jews were involved in uh, violation of the commandment not to make graven images or to worship any other entity besides God, and they were involved in the uh, Operation uh, Golden Calf mess and partying like crazy and all the associated sins therewith, Moses comes down from the mountain with these two tablets that God had inscribed the Ten Commandments on, and he smashed them. They had to go back up and get a second set. They put that in the most holy place of the tabernacle. So breaking the law in one point, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's the whole thing. You are therefore minus R by definition because of personal sin. The solution is found in the law as well. 
the law says, okay, you can't, you can't earn, earn immortality because you're minus R. God is plus R, will not have fellowship with minus R. So what's the solution? It is found in the uh, ritual of the animal sacrifices. That's where the answer is. That's how you get plus R and justified by faith. So, of course, the Jews of, G uh, of Paul's day and Jesus' day and all the way down to the modern day are holding to the idea that because they are Jews uh, and so forth and so on, that they're okay. Uh, the, 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 the Gentile world, their sins are obvious. The Jews are too. You do the same stuff. Let's quit fooling ourselves. And then he gives, the, in this chapter, he addresses all of this towards a, 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 a hypothetical or a real Jew, whoever might have read it. Uh, so we'll read the verses again. Here we have a glaring example of the hypocrisy of the teacher of the law in Paul's day all the way down to the present. But if you bear, if you bear the name Jew, and you do, first class condition, and rely upon the law and boast in God, it's an empty boast, but they boast in God, that they've got it right. And know his will, supposedly, and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law and this teacher of the law are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. Now, he takes him to the next step. You've got a problem. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You preach that one should not steal. Do you steal? This demands a yes answer. Stealing, taking what isn't yours. You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? The answer demands a yes by the structure of the Greek. You who have abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now, last night, we demonstrated that for anyone who would read this, one would not know the background to why these two sins, the Eighth and Ninth Commandments, as well as the command, are brought into view here. The stealing is related to the plunder or robbing of temples. Temples. That must be the Jews out in the dispersion who thought it was okay from time to time to raid and go into Gentile houses of quote-unquote worship and steal the items of intrinsic value. Remember that also the temples of antiquity and in the Roman world, temples were also banks. <laughs> they did banking there. Not, not some separate place as far as I've been seen. So this teacher of the law would presumably think it's okay because we can do this to pagans because they're pagans. No, if you steal from a pagan, it's still stealing. If you have sex with a pagan, it is still a violation. How stupid can you get? So they were basically saying, this is okay. And this teacher of the law had, I don't know how Paul, Paul knew what the Jews were up to. You boast in the law. Through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? The answer should be all these, yes. You dishonor God and you misrepresent him before people. Let's forget about the fact that you're not even a believer. You dishonor God by engaging in this type of violation of a pagan temple by entering the place, stealing some gold artifact, some idol or whatever, looting the treasury, I don't know, 
And then what about the sex part? Having sex with a temple prostitute. That's, your, that's the adultery part. And then he ends it with a scripture. And again, this is like, you're this, you're this Jewish teacher, scholar, expert with regard to the details of the Old Testament, right? You've read it backwards, forwards. You've got to, you know all that's in there. It's funny how these kind of people miss key verses. So he says, for the name of God, which means his reputation, a person's name carries with it a certain reputation, not just, you know, a name name, but a rep the name of God is maligned or blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. How so? By the Jews acting like these Jews and by the fact that they were evicted from their land. The Gentiles all knew the Jewish claim that their God gave them this special land, a land of promise and perpetuity. They knew this. They heard this. It was well known among the Gentile peoples that they were, they touted themselves as God's chosen people, which they were. But why is God's chosen people suffering so much, kicked out of their land, and so forth? The blasphemy of the Gentiles, the slander is, well, their God couldn't uphold his end of it. Nothing could be further from the truth. Their God orchestrated this discipline according to their law. In Leviticus 21, the extreme punishment for Jewish reversionism in the land was what? Eviction. You act up and you carry it to a point and you never turn around and pull your act together, then eventually you leave me no choice but to evict you from this land and put you out there with the Gentiles and all the sufferings and all that's associated with that event, just as it says in the law. This is what amazes me. It shouldn't, I suppose. How could a Jewish person who can read just as well as you and I not read that in Leviticus and conclude that we're not in a good place the Jewish leadership, at the, when Jesus was there, high priest, all these people. Why are we under the thumb of the Romans, those pagans, before they were actually taken by those pagans and put under their third dispersion? Wouldn't, that, wouldn't you conclude from that that God is not pleased at all and is bringing down his wrath like he said he would in the Leviticus in the Leviticus chapter 26 our cycles of discipline where God keeps keeps increasing the ante if you read through it you'll see you're going to start having seeing these problems in your land it might relate to disease it might be a uh, locust plague it might be drought it might be uh, whatever it is uh, wild animals attacking your children. I'm, under, I'm in control of wild animals, by the way, God is. And all that begins to escalate. Look at yourselves and realize what you're doing is bringing this on. And if you turn to me and turn away from what it is, you, idolatry before the, the, final, the third dispersion, that's, that's, your, that's your blackout of the soul, that's your scar tissue of the soul. It is so easy to, to ascertain. We're not good Jews, corporately. We're bad Jews. We're bad chosen people, if you will, racially. That's why believers are supposed to start figuring things out if one bad thing after another starts coming down on your head. You need to check in, do inventory of, of your attitude towards Bible doctrine in application, attendance, and all these other factors. Because God tries to get people's attention by things that are not pleasant. Again, I'm not, a, I'm not judging every 
there's, there's, there's righteous testing that like Job or whatever that has nothing to do with that. But check the inventory. What you're supposed to be doing versus what you might be doing. It's called divine discipline. And God will continue to up the ante for certain people. What do you do when you catch yourself and you got out of line? Well, you have to be big enough to admit it to yourself and confess it and turn back to the straight and narrow. That's all. God uses these kind of things to get our attention. And they're unpleasant when we are continually running under and justifying and rationalizing our STA behavior. Okay. So the, the Gentiles would not have been able to do that and blaspheme God. They blaspheme God anyway, but, but not the Jewish, the Jewish uh, thing fueling it. Yeah, the Gentiles are stupid too. They should, if they, it, when you're in the know, you say the chosen people are out under the fifth cycle according to what the Bible said would happen to them if they misbehaved, went apostate, whatever, in the land. And in, in, the, in the first two dispersions, exiles, it was idolatry, conventional idolatry, and all of its, all those practices. The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and in the third instance, it was they were violating the legal code of the law and turning it into an instrument of salvation by works. That's bad. Real bad. And it exemplified their hostility by their treatment of Jesus, first advent, their own Messiah, who they corporately repudiated. All right, this evening, of all subjects, because this is, this is a practice that is especially noted among Jews, the, the rite of circumcision. He continues, and addressing a single individual, as it were. For indeed, circumcision is a value if you practice, proso, the law. <clears throat> the, uh, okay, circumcision is the noun peri tome, which is expressive in and of itself because it means to cut around. For indeed, on the one hand, circumcision is of profit, ophaleo, present active indicative, if, third class condition, maybe yes, maybe no, if you practice the law. Practice is proso, and it's subjunctive, that's why it's a third class condition. But if you are a transgressor of the law, if you are a transgressor, parabetes is the noun, translated transgressor, it means like to step over a line. But if you are a transgressor, transgressor of law, without the article, as it above, though it's in the translation, if you are, present subjunctive of Imi, your circumcision has become Perfect, active, indicative, genomai, to become uncircumcision. Acrobustia, uncircumcision. Continue with this line of thought. So if the uncircumcised man, that'd be, in his day, uh, uh, typically a Gentile, if the uncircumcised man <clears throat> keeps this is a strong word, and it's a third-class condition. Present subjunctive of phulaso means to guard or keep something that you consider valuable. If you ke keeps the requirements, and this is accusative, neuter, plural, dia, kaioma, the requirements of the law, 
Will not his uncircumcision be recognized or regarded, future active indic passive indicative, logizomai, regarded as circumcision? What? And he who is physically uncircumcised. <clears throat> All right. Uh, he who is physically, physically is natural condition. Phusis, we've seen it before in Romans. <clears throat> if he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, teleo, then you have the definite article. If he keeps the law, Will he not judge you? And this is, a, this is a righteous judgment. Will he not judge you? <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, who keeps uh, will he not judge you future active indicative my I got off the line here because the Greek word order is not the same as the English so God, bear with me a minute. I mean and will he not judge you, uh, the physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law with the article? Will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law, the one having the grama, the letter, and circumcision, are a transgressor, same word, of the law. Then he adds this. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Phaneros. Present active indicative. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. There's another circumcision of which physical circumcision is simply an illustration, a ritual to illustrate it. And he defines this in our verse 29. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly on the inside, the hidden, kruptos. And circumcision is that which is of the heart that's not the physical heart that pumps blood, of course. It's synonym for the soul. And circumcision is that which is of the heart. In physical circumcision, it involves a specific cutting instrument. The cutting instrument here is by the spirit. Or in the spirit, locative of pneuma, not the letter, grama, and his praise is not from men. Epinos is praise, not from the source of men, but from the source of the God, Theos. <laughs> One, having established that the self-righteous teacher of the law falls into the same category as the Gentile, point one, the ones whom the Jew berates, Paul advances the indictment of the Jew by informing him as to who the real Jew is in God's eyes. What good does it be to be a racial Jew if you don't have the reality? It's, it's nothing. What good is circumcision if you don't have the corresponding spiritual reality? It's nothing. Circumcision as a ritual was instituted as the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. What was the sign of the Noahic covenant? The rainbow. It's God's sign or promise that he'll never bring a universal flood on the earth, though he's brought two universal floods on the earth, actually. The one that's, that turned the earth into tohu wabohu in Genesis 1-2 and the one in Noah's day. This earth has been inundated and covered with water two times. But it'll never happen again. There's plenty of water out there to do it. Not just the water that's on the surface. 
But most of the water on earth is under the surface. There's lots of it under the surface. Circumcision as a ritual was instituted as the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. And Abraham was the first Hebrew to undergo this procedure. Abraham had no idea this was coming. In his 99th year, in his 99th year, he gets told that, the, that he needs to be circumcised. Fun, fun. When you read about it in there, he says, oh, can we do something else? He gets right to it and has himself circumcised. Circumcision was practiced in various forms in other nations. But the, the removal of the entire foreskin is what is in view here of the male phallus. Circumcision as a ritual was instituted as a sign of the covenant with Abraham. And Abraham was the first Hebrew, period, and the first Hebrew to undergo this procedure. The background and the story is found in Genesis 17. Abraham was circumcised when he was 99 years of age. He'd been a believer a long time. I don't know what the age of Abraham was when he became a believer. I do know what his age was when God came to him and made him this offer that we call the Abrahamic covenant. If you'll do what I tell you to, the, the, the specifics of the Abrahamic covenant, there are, there are things you've got to do in order for you to come under the blessings of this covenant. You've got to leave her and your family back behind. Not your wife, but your extended family. And you've got to, and you've got to pack up everything. And you've got to leave this comfortable life you had in this metropolitan city of Ur of the Chaldees. Well, where am I going? And I will show you later. I'm going to give you a land and your descendants. And in your descendants, there will be a descendant through whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. I will make you the father of multiple nations, a primary nation and multiple nations. First, the chosen race. So Abraham packed his bags and headed north up the Tigris River Valley towards the north and stopped at a town of Haran. Guess who he took with him? Lot, his nephew, because his older brother died. And so he took the kid and took care of him. And he took dear old dad with him. His name is Terah. He sat there and cooled his heels for five years. He didn't hear a peep from God. Would that undermine your faith? Was I hearing things back there? Did the devil tell me this? Whatever stupid stuff people do. Well, Tira died. Sometimes people have to die to get us down the next, the next step to where we need to go. Loved ones. Sometimes, not always, but occasionally. So he heads, what, what direction am I going to go? I go? I'm not going to go back south. North, uh, I don't want to go. It's very mountainous. I don't want to. And east doesn't appeal to me. I'm heading west. God's with the positive believer. So he takes all of his, see, he had to get a new profession. So he got, he took what funds he got, and he got in the livestock business. He headed west. He comes to, he, 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 he uh, along the way, he comes to Damascus, Syria. You know, that's the capital of Syria. It's in the news. We're bombing the place. I feel so free. Syria, Damascus. Damascus is the oldest continual occupied city on earth. Did you know that? Well, now you know it. I, I'm not talking about it was laid into ruins and then it rose up again. And that happens with places like Jerusalem. Damascus is in the prophetic news, too. 
it's going to be wiped out and made a desolation. And I don't know when in relationship to the day of the Lord, but it's, it's in the news. It's the capital of Syria. It's a, it's a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 17. And then he finally winds up in the land after five years after the call of Abraham. Uh, and uh, God speaks to him again. Reiterates the Abrahamic covenant said, this is the land. You made it to the right geography. Now here's what you do. You travel up and down and explore it. At the time, it was the land of the Canaanites. It was sparsely populated comparatively to what it was at the conquest. So he was a resident alien who came to the land with his wife, with Lot, with his livestock. He picked up a really good servant off of a, off of a slave block up in, up in Damascus. A positive guy. A guy you could trust your life with. A guy who was never going to turn their back on you and would do everything you told him to do just exactly like you said it. His name is Eliezer. Eliezer of Damascus. When, he, when Abraham had his first child by Sarah and only Isaac, the first link in the chain, you can't have a father of many nations and many people as a, and all this elaborate stuff if you don't have one son. When he got ready, Isaac was a different type of personality. He was the more passive. He wasn't the alpha male <laughs> like Jacob. He's the more passive guy. And Abraham had to get a wife for him. His dad had to get a wife for him. It wasn't because he was a wimp. So he tells Eliezer to go back to his relatives in Haran. Because I don't want Isaac going there. They will mess with him. And, and I don't need him up there being influenced by them. My relatives. And his relatives were believers, by the way. So I taught this stuff over and over and over. And people don't seem to get it. They don't want to get it. You have some relatives, they're not positive. Write them up as not positive. I didn't say mistreat anybody. Witness doctrine to them. If you want to do something. He had Eliezer go and get, him, and get, uh, get Isaac, his right woman. And there's a whole story of it. It's a beautiful story. He arrives there. And yeah, they tried to manipulate Eliezer. Get him stay longer than he needed to. But Eliezer was on a mission for Abraham. It's like he was his alter ego. I'm doing this. You know, some, there's a rare person that's like that. They want to ad lib. They want to do something different. They're, they're smarter than Abraham. And God blessed him and he brought back one Rebecca. And brought to Isaac, his right woman. When he got to the land, he's 75 years old. Now, he's not like 75 today. Okay, I'm almost that. It's not like a 75 today. You know, when you read the Bible and you see these people live so long, you say, this is ridiculous. I, I, I would wait just a minute, okay? <laughs> they had superior person like Noah, they had superior DNA. Way superior. That's why they could live for centuries. Then this began to get less viable as time went on. It wasn't just about good diet. That's important too, and things of that nature. They had superior DNA to live to those, those big numbers you see in the Old Testament. So-and-so lived so many years. Adam, Adam hit 960. And of course, Methuselah set the record, apparently. 969. He couldn't quite get to 1,000, could he? 
But he died on the day of the flood. That's when he checked out. Off subject, okay, that's my, my deal. So Abraham underwent the procedure. Then he was told to circumcise all the males in his organization, which he did. They're all circumcised. This is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And it would seem so strange, why would removing the foreskin from the male, why would that symbolize anything of importance? We're getting to that. It's God's choice. Moses, influenced by his first wife, she was a pill, a believer, but she was a pill, failed to circumcise his second son in a timely fashion and came near to the sin unto death. Just some history of circumcision. Moses almost died the sin and the death because he violated this ritual. All Jews were to have to be circumcised on the eighth day. The reason for the eighth day is medically. You don't want the baby bleeding to death. There's changes that are going on in blood coagulation. So God's smart, see? And maybe there is a spiritual significance to the number eight. I don't know what it is. You wait eight days and you circumcise all your male children. And another episode of interest is the fact that the rebellious Exodus generation failed to circumcise their sons born to them during the 40 years. Now the Jews down in Egypt were practicing it. But when the Exodus generation got out, these people, they didn't do it. They violated this ritual. And we saw what happened to them. The adult males of Israel, that all these adult males that didn't get circumcised, who walk in as adults in the land of conquest and cross the Jordan and come in there, they're all uncircumcised. They were born in the land. You remember, they were out there 40 years. All these males, once they crossed the Jordan, they had a mass circumcision of all these males. That would have been the time for the Canaanites to attack. because they are disabled. You are not gonna jump up and defend yourself when you're in that kind of pain in that region of your body, guaranteed. But then God's protecting everybody, taking care of everybody. They healed up after a few days, they're all ready to go. They're in compliance. That's in Joshua 5, two through nine. And it's a funny name they gave the place. I told you that back when I taught Joshua many, many, many moons ago. Uncircumcised foreigners, like a Gentile come, comes to visit Israel. Foreigners came and visited in Israel were prohibited from observing the Passover if they came during the Passover season unless they were first circumcised. Exodus 12, 48. Israelites that refused to be circumcised for whatever reasons were to be excommunication, excommunicated from the nation. Not executed, but excommunicated. Kicked out. Nations do that from time to time. They kick certain people out of their country because for whatever reasons. Genesis 4, 17, 14. Jesus, born under the law, was circumcised on the eighth day. Luke 2, 21, as was John the Baptist. Luke 1, 59. Circumcision, by itself as a ritual, was null and void in God's eyes. If the, if, the, if the individual circumcised did not meet the spiritual requirements of the law, or put another way, fulfill the symbolism involved in circumcision. There is a symbolism. Something is removed from the body Flesh that is not essential to the function of that part of the body is removed and thrown, and thrown away. Does not affect the individual in any way with regard to that part of the male anatomy. Not a bit. As noted, circumcision as a ritual, a prescribed divine ritual, 
was instituted in the days of Abraham. That meant all the male believers from Adam down, they were not circumcised. They, they weren't required to be. God can introduce a new ritual anytime he wants to. First and foremost was the requirement to make the salvation adjustment. So Paul's words to the reader, you, is singular, as in the preceding verses, is that circumcision, circumcision has import, is of value, if you practice the law, verse 25a. Only by practicing the law was circumcision of any significant. What is the significance of practicing the law? It's not to just take the law and take this part of it out of here and say, well, I'm doing these overt things and that's enough. It's what the law signified. The law is a guide to lead people to their need for salvation through a, through a savior foreshadowed in the ritual sacrifices. What's all that about? It's portraying this is the way of forgiveness and the way to gain plus R. That's the big argument in Romans. Big part of the argument anyway. So failure to practice the law, practice the law, nullified the ritual for the individual. They were just in overt compliance with the requirement to live in Israel as a male. That's the, what the, all they got out of it. A transgressor of the law was anyone who failed to comply with the most essential aspect, which was the way of salvation, of which this ritual portrays something related to the salvation experience. A religious Jew who misused the law was one who was trying to gain eternal salvation, divine approbation, the praise of God, however you want to express it, by the works of the law, which over and over again in the New Testament, no one is justified by good works. There is a place for good works after salvation, but not in order to acquire salvation. You couldn't come up with enough of them if you worked every day at it because of the sin factor. And more, more on that, we're behind, we're, we're behind the proverbial eight ball the minute we're born, before we ever commit our first sin, before we ever get old enough to rebel as, a, as an infant and show your STA off. If you have an infant, you've seen them show off their STAs. You're smiling. I know what you mean. My first son, one of the ways he tried to show it off, he thought that if he laid in his crib and cried, he'd get attention. Now, you have to differentiate between if you have a bellyache, <laughs> you're really crying because that's all you can do because you're, you don't have any vocabulary. Say, my tummy hurts. And you're just trying to get somebody to hop out of bed and do this with you. Now, don't, don't follow my advice on this. You've got to be led by God. I knew that's what he was doing. And, of course, he had diapers on that are about this thick. And I pulled him up out of there and hit those diapers a couple times. It wouldn't have hurt him physically, only emotionally. He quit doing that. Now, don't follow my advice. You do what you're going to do. <laughs> So we could have a good night's sleep and not have him constantly jerking Brenda around or whatever. I knew that was what he's doing. <clears throat> uh, the point is that before the, uh, what I was getting to in that long drawn out deal, uh, is that when we'll get to this in Romans, when we are born into this, and I told you this last night, and I've said it many times, when we're born into this world, we're, we're a carrier of the sin nature. God must judge all sin and sinful conditions. Okay? All of the sinful conditions of humanity, overt sins, mental sins, all the sins of humanity were judged in Christ. Mind-boggling. Just absolutely mind-boggling. The amount of sins committed on this earth right now, in the next minute, is astronomical. Astronomical. You probably won't get off this parking lot before you sin again. Maybe. <clears throat> there are sins of omission and commission. 
You should, you should treat people around you. You may not be the outgoing type. You should teach people, treat people around here with grace and love and not by a bunch of emotionalism, but simply by acknowledging their existence. You don't have to know them. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. That's enough. Now, you might even introduce yourself to somebody. You might even say hello to me walking down the aisle. I won't bite your head off. I'm not a bad guy. I don't care what you heard out there. I care about you. I've proven it over the years. You are a part of my flock, presumably, of your own volition. <clears throat> and uh, if necessary, if it came to it, I'd die for you. It was in the will of God. I'm not going to abandon you. Maybe dying would be the easy part. But I'm not going to dump you. I'm not going to walk away. If I got off, and I won't get if I got offered a church of a thousand, these people are really positive, Jack. It's not like a bunch of these jackasses that left your church. What well, if somebody said that? They're right out here. They're waiting. They've been listening to your stuff online, and they are gun-ho. I'm fantasizing, okay? <laughs> Hallucinating, maybe even. And they really are. I can prove it to you. Look at their letters and the things they say online. They'd like you to come be their pastor. No dice. I'm here. Let them come here. That's what I would tell them. I'm not doing that. The true shepherd does not abandon his flock when the wolves come. John 10. And the true follower of a shepherd who identifies him as their right pastor knows his voice. It's a beautiful story. Sheep, the four-legged ones, When the shepherds would take them out of the enclosure and each shepherd had come to the door and call his sheep like you'd call your dog and the dog knows your voice, the sheep knew his, his voice, his cadence. If a stranger came, they run. The stranger doesn't have to be a bad guy. It's just not their right shepherd. That's how God programmed these little woolly creatures. So he goes out there, he calls them by name, and he's out there with them during the day so they can graze on green pastures and drink nice water. And he's always on his guard for the wolf. That's why he carries a sling that he practices with. I saw a thing on TV, these guys, I think it was in Spain, and they were doing these things like this with a sling. They could, I mean, now that projectile hit that target dead on. And you got, and so I know how, how, how David brought down Goliath. He drilled him right between the eyes. His big old body and everything, it just scrambled his brain. So that's what, that's what shepherds do. They, they, I, I try to protect people. Uh, I'm limited in what I can do. I warn you, so when you start hearing stuff that doesn't fit, you run, you get away from it. You don't entertain it. If you do anything, you can oh, text back. This is way out of line. You need to reconsider. But all I can do is do that and tell people, follow your right pastor, teacher, shepherd to the end. Well, what if you quit that? I don't have any intention to teach you false doctrine, I pray about this. God is my witness. Keep my, keep my message clear. I'm not going to be perfect. I got, I got details I can correct, but none of them that will throw you off track as far as the maturity adjustment. If you go off track, it's going to be your doing, not mine. Through either I didn't teach you the whole counsel or I taught you something grossly wrong. Yes, we've suffered the ravages of the wolf, but not because I didn't warn you. As Paul said to the Ephesian elders, some of you, they, they, they would probably look around, not me. 
Some of you are going to raise up and ravage the flock and go nuts spiritually. It was a prophecy on his part that unfortunately came true. So the law was never intended to be the pathway to salvation, ever, in the simple overt manifestation of the way the law was. The law, when we usually focus that on the Ten Commandments and the do's and don'ts, the law was designed, in fact, to point uh, out the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten our positive volition in these important matters. In Christ's name, amen.